which came first, the chicken or the egg? To solve this riddle, we'll venture into the concepts of emergence and computational irreducibility, drawing parallels with our universe's structure. Chris Lado, welcome to Lado Files. Emergence tells us that from simple components, usually many, many simple components, complexity can arise. In physics, emergence is used to describe a property, law, or phenomenon, which occurs at macroscopic scales in space or time, but not at microscopic scales. Despite the fact that a macroscopic system can be viewed as a very large ensemble of microscopic systems. An emergent behavior of a physical system is a qualitative property that can only occur in the limit that the number of microscopic constituents tends to infinity. Theoretical physicist P.W. Anderson states it this way. The ability to reduce everything to simple fundamental laws does not imply the ability to start from those laws and reconstruct the universe. The constructionist hypothesis breaks down when confronted with the twin difficulties of scale and complexity. At each level of complexity, entirely new properties appear. Psychology is not applied biology, nor is biology applied chemistry. We can now see that the whole becomes not merely more, but very different from the sum of its parts. In this sense, emergence is a new property. You are more than the sum of your constituent parts. You are more than the 37 estimated trillion cells that make you up. And so I think the essential phenomenon is this interplay between the computational process, what I call computational irreducibility of the actual dynamics of the molecules, coupled with the computational boundedness of our ability to observe things. So when we make observations, we're always taking lots of detail and we're aggregating it together. Like when we look out at, you know, the scene that I'm looking at right now, there are, you know, there are lots of photons falling on the retina of my eye. There's lots of nerve impulses, but in the end, I'm just, I'm looking at a camera. That's the, that's the thing my brain is thinking. I'm taking all that detail and I'm kind of aggregating it down to this one fact that I'm looking at this camera. And by the way, I'm not working out every individual pixel and, and doing this very complicated computation on them. I'm just averaging them in some simple way. And so, you know, I think the, the, the core of the second law is this interplay between the underlying computational process, which is kind of like doing this encryption and the, the way that we observe it, which is we are limited in our ability. Our minds are kind of, and our sensory apparatus and our measuring devices are limited in their sort of computational ability. They can't follow every individual molecule. They can't do that, that cryptanalysis to find out where it came from. Now, when I talk about sort of the, the dynamics of the system encrypting its initial conditions, the way we have to think about it is the, the process of of physical process of molecules bouncing around and so on, that's like a computation. Now the question is, can is it like a computation where we can just jump ahead and say, and the answer is 42, or is it a computation where the only way we can know the answer is by doing every step in the computation? And one of the things that I discovered in the 1980s and, and uh, have sort of built a lot on top of is this idea of computational irreducibility that there are many computations, even ones specified by incredibly tiny programs, which have this feature that you really can't reduce them. You can't jump ahead and say, and the answer is going to be this. You're really just stuck going through every step in the computation. In fact, I mean, this phenomenon of computational irreducibility is, I think, one that is sort of a tremendously important sort of piece of science and intuition, because it's the thing that kind of tells you science isn't going to be able to give you all the answers. Wolfram introduces a new concept here. I believe two sides of the same coin. You have emergence and computational irreducibility. The same sense that we can't identify or readily predict the emergent properties that will come about when you have 37 trillion cells, for instance, human cells that make you up. If we're looking from the other direction, right? If we're looking at a person 
and trying to deduce what is actually makes up the internal components. What Wolfram is stating is that that is computational irreducibility, meaning if you look from above, looking down now, you can't do the math below one human, meaning you can't make a nation of half humans and you can't make a human out of half cells. You need entire full cells to act as integers, if you will, to build up the human. And you need humans, full humans, not half humans or parts of humans. You need full intact emergent humans to actually act as the units of a nation to build onto a nation. But how many cells does it take to build a nation? We don't know. That's computational irreducibility, meaning we couldn't even define it. But we can reduce a nation, for instance, down to humans. You could say a nation is made of 330 million humans, such as the United States. How many cells now? We don't know. That's the idea of computational irreducibility, meaning we can't compute it. The same thing, we can't predict what emergent properties will actually emerge until we run the system, until we run the actual experiment. That is what Stephen Wolfram is arguing. Emergence and computational irreducibility are two sides of the same phenomenon. So that's, I think, the core of what's going on. It's, it's this process uh, of, of sort of computational irreducibility underneath and our sort of limited computational abilities um, kind of uh, uh, at the top. Now, you know, I, I will say that, that uh, I mean, this is, gosh, we, this, this gets quite deep quite quickly, but, but um, um, the, um, one of the things, okay, so uh, in, in 20th century physics, there were sort of three big theories, uh, general relativity, theory of space-time, quantum mechanics, and statistical mechanics, the theory of what happens with lots of lots of molecules and so on. And the, the sort of the key result of statistical mechanics is the second law of thermodynamics. And what people had thought in the 1800s was, well, statistical mechanics and the second law in particular, we're going to be able to derive that from sort of the mechanics of, of molecules. There's just going to be some way in which the mechanics of molecules inevitably leads to the second law. But they didn't think that general relativity would be of that character, nor did they think quantum mechanics would be of that character. They thought those things would be things that were just, well, the universe happens to be set up that way. We don't get to derive those kinds of things. The thing that for me is just, I'm really excited about, is that I think we now understand that all three of those theories are in the same sense derivable, and they all come from the same phenomenon, which to me is just, well, if you're in the physics business, I think that's spectacular. But and so and this it's the phenomenon of the interplay between computational irreducibility of underlying processes and our feature as observers. The fact that we are observers that are the way we are with our kind of computationally bounded abilities and so on is that happens to be the way we are. We could imagine the aliens, so to speak, who work differently, but we work this way. And so yeah. the thing that we then discover is in the case of space time, what we now think is that the universe at a sufficiently small scale is made of discrete atoms of space that are related by this kind of hypergraph. And as sort of the, the process, time is the process of the progressive rewriting of that hypergraph. Time is the computational process. The passage of time is the execution of the computation that is those pieces of the hypergraph getting rewritten. But we don't perceive space as a bunch of atoms of space in a hypergraph. We perceive continuum space. The fact that we perceive continuum space is because we are making a sort of computationally bounded observation. We are averaging out all those individual atoms of space because at our scale, we're 100 orders of magnitude maybe bigger than the atoms of space. So we don't get to sort of see, oh, there's one atom here, one atom there. We just aggregate all of those things. So we are observing sort of space as continuous because we are observers of the kind we are. And it turns out that the other important criterion about us as observers is that we are observers who believe we are persistent in time. So in our models, 
the, you know, we are made of these atoms of space. Every moment in time, we're sort of getting rewritten into new atoms of space, but we believe we have a consistent thread of experience. And yeah. those two facts turn out to give one the equations of general relativity when applied to, you know, when you do the kind of the mathy stuff underneath. And, the, and it turns out the same story happens in quantum mechanics. Anyway, the, the, the end result is that this sort of boundedness of the observer is, is kind of inter, interacting with the underlying computational irreducibility seems to tell us that we inevitably, as observers like us, it's inevitable that we perceive physics to be the way it is. Our universe showcases emergent properties across different and often largely disparate scales similar to the chicken and egg problem. For instance, from atomic particles, molecules emerge. But how did the very first particle come into existence? A cosmic chicken or egg dilemma. How did the first macromolecules come to existence? The first amino acids, the first eukaryotic cells, the first animals. How did these come into existence? This is a emergent property that it requires many, many, almost trillions of cells as they reach the limit. Wolfram cellular automata with its simple rules sometimes gives rise to unpredictable and intricate patterns, an echo of our central riddle. These patterns reflecting both emergence and CI or computational irreducibility are scattered across our universe from galaxies to the smallest quantum realm these emergent properties, and from the other side, seemingly computational irreducible elements. The fractal universe concept suggests a repeated interplay of these patterns across scales, each holding its unique unpredictability. So back to our initial riddle, which came first, the chicken or the egg? I think the better question is, which emerged first? which emerged first. And according to Wolfram, we actually don't know this without running the computation. That is the point. This could be computationally irreducible, meaning the emergence of the chicken or the emergence of the egg. You actually can't define it. You can't mathematically determine because it's computationally irreducible. In other words, nature is unpredictable. In order to actually learn what the emergent properties will be, you have to run the system of life. And to actually know what is computationally irreducible, you have to look from above. The fractal universe theory looks for patterns across all these scales. In both the chicken's evolution and cosmic scales, we witness the interaction of emergence and computational irreducibility as two sides of the same coin, and questions remain. According to Wolfram, we can only learn those questions by actually running the experiment because life is so complex. And at every scale of dimensions, we could have computational irreducibility, meaning you just have to run this game of life, this experiment of life to actually see what will happen. If you did like this theory video, please smash the like button. And if you have an idea for how we can get better evidence of the phenomenon, cheap, fast, effective, then make a YouTube video and put hashtag UAPDSI in the title. By the end of November, you will have a chance to win $1,000 in Ethereum, second place $500 in Ethereum. The idea is to get all these videos out, ideas on how we can get better evidence for the phenomenon. If you want exclusive content, Additional bonus, go to patreon.com forward slash Chris Lato or become a YouTube member here on YouTube. Couldn't do it without your support. Thanks again. Have a great day. Peace.